Good afternoon or good morning to everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to today's session on our not-for-profit speaker series. I am Matthew Saha. I'm an audit partner with Cherry Beckert, and uh, I lead our not-for-profit industry practice for the firm. And I just want to thank you for joining us for what is the first session of our 2023 not-for-profit speaker series. Um, again, we bring this series to you free of charge. It is meant for not-for-profit leaders, not-for-profit enthusiasts, supporters, uh, all folks uh, who are interested in making their not-for-profit that they're involved with a better organization, a more nimble organization, more innovative organization. So thank you again for joining us. And certainly we have a topic that we field a ton of questions on uh, today which is the subject matter of unrelated business income, talking about all the core concepts related to UBI, uh, planning opportunities, and of course, all recent changes uh, in tax reform that uh, changed the way that we report those items. So very relevant topics today. And uh, certainly we wanna get to uh, that subject matter and speaker, but before we do that, just a few ground rules to go over and some housekeeping items. So I know that a lot of folks here are CPAs and want to receive their continuing professional education. So we just remind you that to answer those polling questions, if you're interested in receiving CPE, even if you're not, please, we love to see those polling question results. So please just take a moment to answer those. You'll have to answer at least three of those questions in order to qualify for CPE. Uh, we will then email you those CPE certificates within 10 days. Uh, and if you have for not received it for some reason, you can always reach out to us at cbhlearning at cbh.com. Also, we get asked often if there's going to be, if uh, this content will be available. Yes, it will. It will be in the form of a recorded version of this uh, session that will be posted to our website at the same place that you registered for this session. So you can go back to that same website to see uh, all the historical uh, content that we had in our 2022 not for profit speaker series, as well as uh, all the sessions for this year's events as well. Um, feel free to type any questions you have into the Q&A window. Um, as you go through, we will try to answer those live as we can. Um, the Q&A window is where you can answer questions. That's a little bit different than the chat window, which is better for um, doing just that, chatting. So if you see someone you know or you want to chat or just um, have a comment, but not necessarily a question, uh, that can go into the chat bot, but the uh, questions should go into the Q&A window. Uh, and finally, a short survey is gonna get sent out. We do really take that feedback seriously to understand if this session was valuable to you, if there's any new subjects you want us to, to put a session together on. So please do fill out that survey at the end of this. And uh, now with all that, I can finally get started. And I'd love to introduce our speaker today, uh, which is a name and face uh, hopefully many of you are familiar with um, because Amanda Adams is just such a subject matter expert in all things not-for-profit taxation. So we're really proud to have Amanda with us. Amanda's our not-for-profit tax uh, managing director who uh, manages our national not-for-profit practice for the firm. So um, I will turn it over to Amanda at this point, but uh, you know me and my dad jokes, uh, Amanda, I just got to lead with that. Um, so, you know, you might, you know, my wife, you might find this surprising, but the other day she called me immature. You know, I told her to get out of my fort was my response. So um, anyway, with that, Amanda, thank you for speaking today and uh, take it on. Thanks, Matthew, and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, as you're aware, we're going to be talking about unrelated business income concepts, kind of walking through the basic rules pertaining to unrelated business income, and then also identifying some opportunities where you may be able to minimize unrelated business income just by structuring the transaction a little bit differently. And then there have been a number of uh, laws passed in the last five years that have impacted the reporting for unrelated business income. So we're gonna talk about those changes. So I wanted to start off by giving you some relevant current data 
um, statistics about organizations filing Form 990-T, but unfortunately, the latest bulletin that was available on the IRS's website was from 2012. Um, so in 2012, about 46,000 organizations filed a 990-T, and that's a very small percentage of the overall exempt organization population, less than 10%. And of those, more than 50% didn't even have net taxable income on their 990T. They had losses. And 501c3s were the most common filers. So we'd like to start off uh, with a poll question just to learn more about you. If you could let us know what type of organization you're affiliated with. Uh, whether that's educational institution, uh, church or other religious organization, cultural or arts-based organization, social services, healthcare, trade association, social club, private foundation, or other. So I know some of you may not be affiliated with an organization. So in that case, other would be appropriate. So I think we'll give everyone just a little bit longer to complete the poll. All right. So it looks like the majority are with educational institutions, followed by um, other. Uh, and we also have some significant religious organizations represented. All right. So let's move along. And let's get to the topic at hand. What is unrelated business income? Uh, why are we here? Why does it matter? Um, so unrelated business income is important because it could result in a tax liability. Uh, it could impact the organization's exempt status. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of the unrelated business income tax, just to kind of understand why it came about. And that will help us understand some of the uh, main concepts behind it as well. So in the early days of exempt organizations, basically once an organization was exempt, it was exempt from tax on all of its income. It didn't matter what type of income it was. Um, but there was a caveat in that if an organization was not operated exclusively for exempt purposes, it could lose that exemption. So really the only way that the commercial activity kind of factored in was whether they should not be exempt at all. Um, so this first case, the Supreme Court case of Trinidad versus Sagrada Orden was um, an a case that focused on this religious order that was earning income from a variety of sources. So basically they had income from kind of what we would think of as passive sources, dividends, interests, rents, but they also had some income from sales of wine, chocolate, and of religious items that were used in their activities. So in this case, what they determined was that these sort of modest income from things that were not religious items and therefore not associated with their exempt activities still did not jeopardize the organization's exempt status because all of the income used from those sales or investment income was rolled back into funding the organization's activities. And so that kind of established what's known as the destination of income test. And basically what that means is that an organization at that time could engage in a commercial activity and not jeopardize its exempt status as long as the income from that activity was used to fund its exempt activities. So I think that concept lingers today. A lot of times when I'm speaking with people about unrelated business income issues, that's kind of the first thing that springs to mind is, well, we're going to be using the funds from that activity over here in our educational activities, so shouldn't it be exempt? Uh, well, that all changed in 1950 um, because then the Congress had been concerned about an increase in commercial activities by exempt organizations. This after the 1924 ruling, exempt organizations kind of got a, a pass, if you will, on engaging in these commercial activities. And so there was this perception that um, a lot of exempt organizations were not only engaged in, in these activities, 
but also that they were getting an unfair advantage over for-profit businesses because of their exempt status. So the Revenue Act of 1950 established the unrelated business income tax for most exempt organizations. Uh, churches were accepted under that rule. Kind of around the same time, um, we had a couple of other cases that really impacted the unrelated business income tax as well as exempt status. The first was in 1945. That was the Better Business Bureau case. And what we've learned from that is that a single non-exempt purpose, if substantial in nature, will destroy the organization's exempt status regardless of the number or importance of other exempt purposes. So taking those two together, we have, you are allowed to have unrelated business income, but it cannot be a more than substantial, it cannot be a more than insubstantial purpose of the organization. The other case is one you may have heard of, which is the CF Mueller Company case. And that was an organization, a macaroni company that was owned by NYU School of Law. Um, no question that they were operating a business, but because all of the sort of net income from that business went to support the School of Law under the destination of income test, there was no jeopardy to their exempt status. The case was concluded in 1951, so the ultimate decision was the exempt status was preserved. However, going forward, um, any activity, business activities conducted directly by the School of Law would be taxed under the unrelated business income rules. Lastly, we have the Tax Reform Act of 1969. Of course, that focused um, a lot on the creation of private foundations, but in the UBIT context, it extended it to all 501c and 401a organizations. And it also expanded the definition of debt financed income, which to that point only covered rent income from sale leaseback transactions. So it expanded it to other types of income uh, pertaining to debt financed property. All right, so let's, uh, we're going to kind of discuss the main concepts. Um, there are three prongs to uh, create unrelated business income. One, the income and from the activity has to be unrelated to the exempt purposes of the organization. Um, it has to be an active trade or business, which is regularly carried on. So those three things are the three factors that if any one of those is not satisfied, then you would not have unrelated business income. So once those three factors are in place, we do have some exceptions that apply that we're going to discuss. And then we have some that are excluded specifically by modifications. And then the debt finance property rules come into play to sort of negate some of those exclusions that exist if the income is coming from property that is debt financed. So the first thing I uh, would like to discuss is talking about the unrelated prong. Um, generally speaking, uh, that can be difficult uh, sometimes when you have um, activities that are sort of expanding from your exempt activities. But uh, again, you kind of have to look at, for example, in the case of merchandise, you would look at the nature of items sold. Um, if you have a bookstore, for example, um, items that are in the bookstore, you know, are they items that are relating to your mission? Do they um, get used in your programs? Or are they you know, games, toys, jewelry? Are they there because um, you think that they will sell? So again, that's the second item, which is sales motivation. So when you're engaging in an activity that furthers your exempt purposes, usually your focus is on teaching something, you know, sharing something, exposing people to something that they need to know, the motivation generally is not to earn a profit, uh, you know, to, to get a certain amount of revenue. So what is the motivation behind selling the items? Are they furthering those exempt purposes? Or do you just think it's something that will be popular with customers? Uh, what is the connection, if any, to the mission of the organization? 
when looking at services, um, you would consider, are these services that are just inherently exempt, like educational uh, services for a school, um, healthcare services for a hospital or other healthcare related organization? Um, are they those types of services which um, kind of fit within the normal context of what an exempt organization would be doing? The other thing you have to look at is who are the services provided to? Is there a charitable class of individuals who are benefiting? So, for example, in the healthcare context, um, is the organization providing services to individuals that otherwise might not be able to afford? healthcare, um, but, you know, sort of the focus is trying to make sure that these people benefit from those services. Um, are you um, looking to, you know, provide services to anyone, anyone willing to pay the amount that you want to charge? Again, you're sort of looking at what is the connection between the activity, the items and the services and the mission of the organization. The next important piece is, is the activity being operated like a trade or business? Uh, many times you may uh, engage in an activity that's just sort of a, a one-off. You know, you have um, an annual event and you think, let's try selling this item or providing this service, uh, but it's not something that is, you know, carried on in a manner that would really compete with a for-profit business carrying on the same activity. So one thing you're going to look at is, um, are you competing with other businesses, in fact? Um, are you providing services that other businesses typically provide? Um, so are you definitely competing with similar businesses? What are the selling techniques? Um, do you hire professionals to um, sell those items? Are you engaging in marketing activities? Um, how are you going about making sure that people are aware of the items that you're selling? Is that carried on in a way that a normal business would carry that on? What does the pricing look like? Are you trying to get fair market value for what you're selling? Um, are you um, instead maybe you're looking at encouraging people that are not able to afford the items? You may have a sliding scale so that pricing is lower for people that can afford to pay less. That would not be normal with a business. Um, what is the personnel motivation? Are they receiving incentives for selling uh, certain items? Um, is their compensation similar to what a for-profit business would provide to encourage sales? What's the customer profile? Again, kind of looking at, is there a connection between the customers that you are trying to reach and your exempt purposes? Are they the people that you would normally serve? Or are these just members of the general public? And then lastly, looking at the organization's focus. Is the focus, the purpose of the activity, a commercial one, trying to generate profits? Or is there an, an exempt purpose that is furthered by the activity, which is the primary focus, whereas revenue and profits being a secondary one? Um, we're not saying that you couldn't possibly have that as a focus. Obviously, organizations do you know, need to preserve their charitable assets but just looking at what the primary reason is behind the activity. And then the third prong is, is the activity regularly carried on? And so for that purpose, you're looking at a few factors. Um, you're looking at what is the planning time behind the activity? An activity that takes place over just a week, um, but requires you know, several months of planning time could still be considered to be regularly carried on because there is a lot of effort that goes into preparing for the activity and conducting it. Also looking at continuity versus continuously. So what that means is that the activity doesn't necessarily have to be something that's engaged in 365 days a year, but perhaps it's a, an activity that you carry on every year for 
a certain amount of time, two weeks, let's say. Um, so just looking at, is it sort of a regular thing that you are you know, engaged in versus just something that's intermittent or maybe you just had an activity once um, and then never engaged in it again. And then just a reminder that seasonal activity, um, if it is something that is normally only conducted during a certain season, um, the fact that you're only conducting it during that time period could mean that it's still regularly carried on. So like, for example, selling Christmas trees, you know, that's not something you would normally see all throughout the year. But if you would be selling trees in the period of time when people would normally sell them, then it could be considered regularly carried on. So now let's talk a little bit about the exceptions. So assuming we've met the three prongs, we have an unrelated trade or business that's regularly carried on, you may still have an exception from unrelated business income so that it would not be taxed. So the first one is the substantial use of volunteers. So if labor is an important um, component of the activity, and you are using volunteers to carry on that activity, then you could have an exception. Um, for that purpose, substantial use of volunteers is considered to be 85% or more. So you would have to look at all of the labor engaged in an activity, and as long as 85% of it was volunteers, then you could exclude the income from that activity from unrelated business income. Kind of where I've seen that is organizations that have uh, you know, a, th a thrift shop or some other shop that's run substantially by volunteers um, that would qualify for the exclusion. The next one is donated goods. If you're selling um, items that have been donated to the organization, um, then again, that qualifies for the exclusion. So that would be sort of similar to the thrift shop, but instead of, let's say it wasn't run by volunteers, but instead by paid staff, if what you were selling were donated items, then you would be able to qualify under that exclusion. A couple of other ones that don't come up too often outside of the 501c3 context are public entertainment. So that's really like um, sort of an agricultural exposition, a fair, rodeo, something like that. Um, and then conventions and trade shows. So we typically see, you know, uh, business leagues may hold those um, for, you know, with an industry focus, the industry that they're focused on, you know, the trade show would get together, um, have uh, things of interest to their industry. Uh, qualified sponsorship payments. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, um, but this is kind of in the advertising area, sort of looking at whether a payment from a sponsor that might require the organization to um, put information about that sponsor on their website, on their magazine, uh, newsletters, um, something of that nature. If it is considered to be a qualified sponsorship payment, then it can be excluded from taxable income. And certain items that are sold or services provided that are for the convenience of members, students, patients, officers, or employees of the organization can also be excluded. So like, for example, in you know, the store option, let's say you're selling, in addition to you know, educational materials that further your exempt purposes, maybe you're selling um, you know, bottles of water or an umbrella or a sunscreen. So if the items would you know, enable those individuals um, to have convenience versus having to leave the area to buy those items, then that's something that could be excluded. It's that's one what you have to kind of watch out for because you know those are the it's not convenience necessarily for everyone. You know, it has to either be, you know, members of the organization or if it's a school, students, a hospital, patients, or employees of the organization. So again, it's not necessarily just going to be every member of the general public, um, it wouldn't make sense for you to provide things for their convenience. And then the last one is low cost articles. So this is a situation where you're providing uh, low cost articles with the name logo of the organization unsolicited um, and 
the individual receiving them is not under any obligation to make a contribution. This is kind of like the circumstance where, you know, you get address labels in the mail um, from the American Heart Association or the March of Dimes, and they're asking you to, you know, please make a contribution, but either way, you're allowed to keep, you know, the, the address labels. So that brings us then to the modifications. Um, so these are the specific items that can also be excluded under certain circumstances. Um, you will notice that a lot of investment type income is included here, interest in dividends, capital gains, um, those are items that are generally excluded from unrelated business income. A rental income is a little tricky, um, so we're going to kind of devote some time on the next slide to talk about that, but the general rule is that rental income from real property is excluded from unrelated business income. Um, Rental income from personal property that's rented with real property can be excluded as long as it's less than 10% of the overall rental payment. If the organization has um, an entity that it controls, either a for-profit entity that it owns more than 50% of, or it even could be another uh, nonprofit entity where it appoints a majority of the board, if the organization receives certain payments from that subsidiary, um, namely those payments are interest, rents, royalties, and annuity payments, and those payments, either in the case of the for-profit entity or a nonprofit entity, reduce the taxable income of that entity, and the income would be considered to be unrelated if the organization was conducting it, those payments of income to the nonprofit would be considered unrelated business income. Um, so that can kind of be a tricky uh, situation um, for organizations. There is kind of a transition period. Um, so if there were contracts in place, uh, you know, from the past, it's possible that there could be an exclusion that would apply. The other important thing to remember is that for all income earned from an S corporation owned by the organization, 100% of the income is considered to be unrelated business income, even if it is the type of income that would otherwise qualify for an exclusion like interest and dividends. Royalties are typically excluded as well. There are a number of cases, however, in which organizations try to assert that a type of income is considered to be a royalty, um, but in fact it isn't. So it has to be a pretty traditional royalty. I think, you know, the most common ones you can think of would be you know, oil and gas royalties, um, but it also could be a royalty for the use of the organization's name, intellectual property, something like that. Research um, for organizations um, that are engaged in research for governmental entities, that is um, not taxed as unrelated business income. For universities and hospitals, all research um, is excluded from unrelated business income. And then for those organizations that are primarily operated to conduct research, as long as that research is made available to the general public, it also will be excluded from unrelated business income. So let's uh, dive in a little deeper on the rental activities. I see we've got a couple of questions um, in the Q&A about that. Um, so as I mentioned before, the general exclusion applies to the rental of real property and a very minor amount of personal property. If the organization is just renting personal property like equipment or furniture, or if it is, um, you know, a substantial part of the rental alongside the real estate, then there uh, could be some exposure to the unrelated business income tax. Uh, basically, there's a phase in so that if the portion that pertains to personal property is between um, 10 and 50 percent, then just the portion pertaining to personal property would be taxed. If it's over 50 percent, then the entire amount would be taxed. So really where that might come up is if you're renting, you know, furnished spaces, um, whether that be like lodging or, you know, potentially conference rooms, a portion of that would contain some personal property as well. <clears throat> 
The next thing to look out for is whether services are being provided. So the exclusion is intended to provide for an activity that's not really an active business. It's just the rental of property. But from the IRS's perspective, once you start providing significant services along with the rental, then that sort of brings it to another level where it's really more like an active business. Um, so for example, that could be if you're renting out a conference room and you're also providing, let's say, uh, audio and visual services, or you're providing catering, any type of service that is for the benefit of the tenant um, would sort of fall under that um, exception and cause the income to be treated as unrelated business income. Services that are really to benefit the organization as the landlord would not count as services. So that might be something like security, like let's say you're a museum. Um, and you're renting out space that has your artwork in it, you know, it would be to your benefit to have your own security uh, to protect the artwork. So if that's sort of their focus, that would, you know, not be the type of service that would be an issue here. But let's say instead of the security for the artwork, you have security in the parking lot to protect the patrons as they're leaving the museum from, you know, the event that could be considered services to benefit the tenants. So it can be tricky. Um, so again, that's something you would wanna look at a little deeper to analyze whether you, know, you were providing services that might run afoul of those rules. The last item to look out for is how the rent is determined. So if the rental income is due based on the net profits of the tenant, then that also invalidates the exception because it's almost like you're in a joint venture with the business. And so you're, you know, depending on the success of their business activity um, to generate your income. So you could have rent that's a flat amount. You could even have rent that's based on a percentage of the gross revenue of the tenant, but you would not want it to be based on the net profits if you were trying to avoid unrelated business income entirely. So we have one question I will um, mention before we run uh, into the debt finance property, which is, what if you rent out office space to companies working in the same industry? Um, so there can be, um, there can be, it's not really an exclusion, but it could further the organization's exempt purposes to provide space to um, similar nonprofits um, at cost, let's say. Um, it might be trickier to you know, be providing that rental space at fair market value. I think it would be harder to sort of find that connection. Again, you're looking at what is the mission of the organization and how is this activity furthering it? Um, you would have to sort of make a case that, you know, for renting this space to them is somehow promoting your exempt purpose. Usually that only falls under situations where like the purpose of the organization is to, let's say, incubate small nonprofits, so, you know, trying to um, reduce their costs. And so really the focus is on kind of making it easier for them to have space. Um, and maybe even providing some other services that they might need. I think in the general situation of just running to other nonprofits at fair market value likely would not be considered related, but as long as it is just the rental of real property, we don't have acquisition indebtedness concerns, it generally would qualify for an exclusion. So let's talk a little bit about debt financed property. Um, so to um, what we need to look at here is whether we have income from property that is subject to acquisition indebtedness. And so that's kind of an odd phrase, but we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, how that is defined. So we have um, debt financed property when you have either acquired property or made subsequent improvements to a property with borrowed funds, and you have a balance of debt related to that property during the year. Um, so the simplest example would be you buy a building, you get a mortgage, 
that would be considered to be debt financed property. So if you have interest, um, I'm sorry, if you have rental income, you know, from some other tenants in the building, then, you know, you would have to sort of fall under these rules and consider a portion of it to be unrelated business income. There is an exception for sort of temporary borrowing. So let's say an organization uh, was having some cash flow issues and they didn't want to sell their investments. They wanted to take out a sort of temporary line of credit um, to be able to pay their program expenses. Um, the IRS has ruled that that would not cause those investments to be considered debt financed property in that circumstance. The rules here can be complicated because they do look at sort of not only did you actually incur debt at the time you acquired or improved the property, but also if you incurred debt later, was it reasonably foreseeable at the time you purchased the property that you would need to incur debt? Um, so it's not as simple as, um, you know, just kind of maneuvering the situation to incur debt later. If you would, if you knew at the time you acquired the property that you were going to have to borrow money to meet your other needs, then the IRS can still come in and say that that property needs to be considered subject to acquisition indebtedness. So the basic calculations uh, provide that if you have income from debt finance property, it doesn't mean that 100% of the income is considered to be UBI. It's a ratio. So you're looking at the average debt over the average basis of the property, and that's going to be your ratio to determine the taxable portion. So if for some reason the average debt is more, is more than the average basis, it's um, you're never going to have more than 100% of the income being taxable. So if your ratio ends up being more than 100%, it doesn't matter. You'll just change that to 100%. So let's look a little bit about some of the special considerations for the calculation. So with real estate, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you've got your mortgage, you've got your one property, you know, the income. Um, that's kind of what was contemplated at the time the regulations uh, were written. But what we see now is that there are a lot more um, sort of indebtedness issues coming up with securities. So you could have a margin account where you're purchasing securities on margin. Um, and so then it becomes a little trickier because you've got um, all kinds of securities being purchased in and out of that account. Um, you've got a lot of transactions happening. Um, so the regulations don't provide specific guidance on that. I have seen some organizations sort of treat the entire margin account as if it were one asset um, and sort of looking at the average debt and the average basis of the account as one thing. And then I have seen others actually tracing the activity of each security um, being purchased and sold and, and really tracking um, those securities that were purchased with debt versus ones that may have been purchased uh, with cash in the account if the account had cash at a time. The other thing that's important to remember is that there is a different ratio when we have uh, the sale of the property versus the ongoing income. So when we have the sale of the property, you actually look at the highest amount of debt in the 12 month period prior to the sale versus looking at the average. Um, so that's important to remember if you, you know, have a sale during the year and there was debt within that 12 month period. There are a handful of exceptions. Um, one is neighborhood land. So if the organization buys some land, which is sort of near the existing land that it owns, and it has a plan to sort of incorporate that in its exempt activities within 10 years, then even if it earns income uh, from the property and is, it is indebted, it can exclude that from unrelated business income. The only caveat there really is that if there's a structure on the land, um, it doesn't necessarily cover the structure. So if the structure was there um, and you're renting it out, the exception would only apply if your plans, once it becomes part of your exempt activities, are, include demolishing that structure. Um, certainly if you built a new structure on the land beforehand, that also would not count. So if it's raw land or if it's a structure that you are going to tear down, 
um, then you could still qualify for the exception. Um, another one is that the property is substantially used for exempt purposes. Um, as substantially is defined as 85%. So if you know less than 15% of the property is you know generating income, so this would typically be like a building context. You're renting out less than 15% of indebted property and using the rest for your exempt purposes. Then there would also be an exception. Schools and their affiliated supporting organizations have special rules here. So basically, they're considered to be qualified organizations. And so for purposes of these debt financed rules, they um, are not do not have to follow them as long as it's real property. So any sort of debt on real property would not cause any unrelated business income for schools and their affiliated supporting organization. There's also an exception if those organizations are invested in a partnership which actually owns the property. Um, it's a little complicated. Um, there are some special rules that would the have to apply at the partnership level. Um, but again, there would be an exception for those organizations if that criteria is met. Um, one last thing on that sort of going along with one of the questions is this also would apply for items that are invested in through a partnership. So if the partnership that you're invested in is the one that has um, acquired debt financed property, the character of that activity flows through the to the partner. So again, it would be if it would be considered unrelated business income, if you did it directly, then it's the same rules are going to apply through a partnership. Um, I know sometimes people think, well, we didn't actually incur the debt. The partnership incurred the debt, um, but the rules are pretty clear on that point that it is still considered to be attributed to the partner in that case. So what are the consequences of unrelated business income? Um, Generally speaking, if you have net positive taxable income, then you have to pay tax. Um, you know, that is not necessarily the worst scenario if the income is a profitable one. Um, if you look at sort of what you're generating on an after-tax basis, could still be worth it to engage in the activity. Um, but another thing that might be um, detrimental beyond the tax would be loss of property tax exemption. So a lot of times um, an exemption on a piece of property requires the organization to use it for their exempt purposes. So if it is not being used in an exempt manner, it's possible to you know, lose that property tax exemption. That could you know, be a substantial tax liability as well. Also, if you if the property is financed with tax exempt bonds, um, you could have some issues there if the activity exceeds the allowable percentage. And then worst case scenario would be the loss of overall exempt status. Um, so there is no bright line test as far as how much UBI is too much. Um, there's, you know, a lot of times people kind of sort of throw out this 15% threshold, but really it's facts and circumstances based. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, the Better Business Bureau case really focused on whether there was a and substantial non-exempt purpose. So again, in engaging in an unrelated business activity, that could not rise to the level of being a substantial non-exempt purpose. All right, this brings us to our second poll question. Want to know how many of you prepare a 990T to report unrelated business income? So we've got yes, no, I'm not sure. All right, so while you're answering that, I'm looking at um, the questions. We've got uh, one question is, when will interest income be taxable? Um, so interest income could be taxable either under the debt finance property rules, if it is from um, a property that is debt financed, or it could be, um, it could sort of fall under the income from a subsidiary. So if a subsidiary um, was paying interest and deducting it from their income, then uh, that could also 
become unrelated business income in the hands of the recipient. All right, so we're evenly split here, about half of you filing, half of you not filing. All right, so let's talk about some opportunities to escape the treatment of income as unrelated business taxable income. So earlier we talked a little bit about qualified sponsorships. So let's sort of dive into that a little deeper because a lot of organizations, um, this is a common thing that comes up. And so we're trying to, you know, sort of determine whether a payment, even though it may be called advertising, that may um, not fit the IRS's definition of advertising. Um, but the IRS generally presumes that if it is true advertising, it is going to be unrelated business income. So for those organizations trying to avoid unrelated business income, it's important to try to, to um, make sure that any sort of advertising activities could fall under the qualified sponsorship rules. So th these are focused on what the content of the ad is. Um, so to qualify as a qualified sponsorship, the ad um, cannot provide qualitative or, you know, comparative language. So that's one thing to look at is the content. The other is sort of the nature of the activity. So if the activity is really just the publication of a program that's going to be at an event that's held one time during the year, the IRS has found that that's really not um, going to be like a regularly carried on business. So even if you had an ad in that kind of a program, um, it's not going to be taxable. But if you have a monthly magazine, um, you know, that's that's going out to, you know, customers, then, you know, the information in there is going to be, you know, more readily available. And so you have to kind of look at the actual words in the ad. So to be a qualified sponsorship, um, the sponsor cannot be expecting or receiving a substantial return benefit. So fortunately for this purpose, the IRS has defined um, an insubstantial return benefit to be showing the name or logo of the sponsor. That's fine, saying um, ABC Company proudly sponsors the organization's event. All of that's fine. Um, where you run into trouble is when you have language that's, that's talking about their product or services, saying it's better, it's faster, it's cheaper, et cetera. That kind of a commercial language would cause it to really be considered a valuable ad. And in that circumstance, you have to look at the value of what you're providing the sponsor and sort of carve that out. Many times the payment is well above um, the value of what they would be getting. Um, so you would just have to be able to quantify the value of benefits being provided so that you can isolate the amount that would be taxable. Next, let's talk a little bit about investment vehicle structure. So we were talking about investments and partnerships and how um, that flows through to the partner. Um, so if the investment vehicle is a corporation, then there's considered to be a wall. Um, if the whatever activity the corporation engages in, that's not attributed to the shareholder. But if it's a partnership, then it is going to be attributed. And so if the partnership is either engaged in an unrelated business activity or has income from debt finance property, there's going to be an amount of unrelated business income that will be reported to the partner on their K-1. So that's something to look out for. If you have partnership investments, be looking at those K-1s for that disclosure about unrelated business income. So beyond the corporation structure, you know, one drawback is, of course, a U.S. based corporation is going to be subject to U.S. tax. So a lot of times what you may see is that a fund may create a foreign corporation to hold kind of the investment fund structure to minimize the you know, tax liability that would be reducing the investment returns. But that could also result in some additional reporting that the investor has because there are certain filings that have to be made when you are contributing um, capital to a foreign structure or if you own more than 10% of that foreign fund. Another thing you can do is to not engage in the activity directly. 
um, to use a third party. Now, what you have to be careful with here is that if you just hire a contractor to carry on the activity, it's still attributed to you. They're just your agent. But what you could do is you could rent the space um, where they're conducting the activity. So for example, if you want to have a bookstore or a cafeteria, you know, you can just rent the space um, to a third party who's actually going to be engaging in that activity. Now you would want to make sure again that you're qualifying under all of the provisions for the rental arrangement, you know, not providing significant services to them, um, not basing the rent on net profits. Uh, but again, you could still have the opportunity to provide things that you might want to to your um, you know, members or constituents or that would sort of add on to your programs, um, but have the potential for unrelated business income. You can just kind of get yourself out of that by having these third parties conducted and you just earn passive rent. What are some exceptions around debt finance properties? So again, you have to be careful here, as I mentioned, um, that reasonably foreseeable rule. Um, we can't you know, necessarily play games here, but you might have an opportunity when you're acquiring property um, that you wanna have long-term um, if it doesn't generate income. So that would make sense you know, to, if you had a choice to use debt on property that's not gonna generate income. Um, or use debt on property that is going to be substantially used for exempt purposes. Um, and then lastly, if you have debt and you know you're going to be selling the property and you have a substantial capital gain, if at all possible, you would want to consider delaying the sale until the 12-month period has expired after the debt is paid off. Um, and that way you would be able to exclude that capital gain from taxable income. All right, so let's go to poll question three. How does your organization receive advertising funds? And okay, so let's see here. Let me pull one of these questions from the Q&A. Um, I assume that corporation status includes LLCs. So that depends. Um, so an LLC can either be considered to be a partnership or it can make an election to be taxed as a corporation. So you would need to know um, how the LLC is considered for tax purposes. Is it a partnership or is it a corporation? All righty. So now let's go on to some recent changes to UBTI calculations. Um, so kind of what I wanna focus here is uh, first on the tax rates. So the TCJA um, basically flattened out the corporate tax rate to provide that it was a single tax rate of 21%. Um, so for exempt organizations formed as corporations, the 990T tax rate is 21%. Um, if the organization is formed as a trust, there will still be um, that graduated trust um, tax rate scheme that you have to adhere to. Um, also, the TCJA repealed the corporate alternative minimum tax. Um, however, you may have heard of a new tax um, that recently came about. It's hard to know exactly how it's going to impact exempt organizations. I don't think it will significantly, um, but it is the new 15% tax on a corporation's book taxable income. So for an exempt organization, um, this would actually be their book unrelated business income. So it wouldn't be their total income, it would be unrelated business income. And I've heard uh, this that the acronym for this um, new type of income is BUBI, B-U-B-I, book unrelated business income. Um, so I don't know of anyone, any of our clients that have a uh, a billion dollars of book unrelated business income, but I'm sure there may be a handful of organizations out there that need to factor that in. Um, there's also the requirement to track unrelated business income by trader business activity. Um, so this was effective for 2018 tax years and forward. Unrelated business income loss uh, 
unrelated business income from one activity cannot be offset by a loss from another activity. And any net operating losses generating by, generated by those activities will similarly be restricted in future years to offsetting only income from that same activity. Um, so the regulations that came out recently on how to compute this sort of fall under three categories. One is you can have investment activities, and that includes qualifying partnership and S-corporation interests, income from debt finance property, all of that can be grouped together as one activity. Any sort of non-investment activity, you would have to define using a two-digit NAICS code. And each um, you know, two-digit NAICS code will be considered its own activity. And then lastly, if you have sort of that specified payment from a controlled entity, the subsidiary, that is going to be aggregated by entity. So each controlled entity will be its own activity for purposes of any payments from that entity. So we'll just talk briefly. I know we don't have a lot of time left, um, but we've got some information here about how um, we can define qualifying partnership interests for purposes of being able to be grouped in that investment activity um, category. There are two tests. There's either the de minimis test, 2%, or the participation test, which is a 20% ownership and some additional factors. Also wanted to point out that there was a transition rule for partnerships that were acquired prior to August 21st, 2018 that didn't meet either of those tests. You could still treat the unrelated business income from that single partnership as its own trader business activity, uh, but that rule has since expired. Um, so for 2021 forward, um, you cannot do that. It will either have to qualify as a qualifying partnership interest, or you'll have to be able to break out the unrelated business income from that partnership into the various two-digit NAICS codes. Um, so let's get over here, the de minimis test and the participation test. Um, so the participation test is a little complicated, but I have not really found many organizations that fail it, um, because generally speaking for investment type partnerships, the organization is not going to have really any control over the partnership, the governing bodies or employees. Um, so, you know, they're just sort of a passive investor. So the only time that might come up is if um, it is something other than an investment partnership. Um, maybe it's a joint venture that has some unrelated business income component to it. Um, also, there's a look through rule that's a bit complicated, but essentially, if the in interest in which the um, organization is directly invested in doesn't qualify, you can kind of look through um, to the what the partnership itself owns, and if there are underlying partnerships owned by that partnership that would qualify, then you can still include the UBTI from those partnerships within your investing activity. Also want to make sure that you understand the changes uh, pertaining to net operating losses, which is that net operating losses generated uh, for 2018 tax years and forward, the net operating loss deduction is limited to 80% of taxable income, and it's carried forward indefinitely. Um, so that's sort of the general rule uh, for those losses, but the CARES Act provided some special provisions which allowed for 2018, 19, and 20 net operating losses to have a five-year carryback period. So even though a loss during those tax years would have been tracked by trader business activity, um, the CARES Act provided that you could carry back that loss to prior years where you didn't have to track uh, UBTI by trader business activity um, to be able to um, get a tax refund for those years. So that was definitely sort of a generous benefit that they provided. Also, the regulations provided just some clarifications on what do you do if you stop a trader business. 
Um, in that case, your net operating loss is going to be suspended until you engage in that trader business again. Um, if you accidentally misclassified your trader business, and so you're changing the code because you used the wrong code before, you can still carry that net operating loss along with the updated and corrected activity code. And then lastly, just wanted to touch on the ordering of net operating losses. It is still chronological so that your oldest net operating losses are used first, and then you would use your later uh, by trader business net operating losses. But the IRS did provide that you can use these, uh, you can allocate them in whatever manner is most advantageous to you. So if you have both pre-2018 and 2018 and later losses, um, you can apply them um, in allocating them whichever way is most beneficial. All right, we've got our last poll question. And thank you for hanging in there with me. I realize we're right at time, um, but we are going to gather your questions. Um, any questions that I was not able to answer uh, during our presentation today, um, I will be able to connect with you later on that. But thank you so much for attending. Um, hope you check out some, some more of the sessions in our series. Again, this was the first session in our not for profit speaker series. So uh, the, the same spot where you signed up for this uh, event, you can sign up for the other ones that we have scheduled. The next one coming up is on April uh, 20th, so just later this month, on how to become a data-driven finance leader. So um, that'll be a great session. I hope that you guys can join us for that. We've also got a couple of good sessions uh, coming up right around the corner in May as well. So. Uh, several of these in quick su succession here. I uh, will be talking about cryptocurrency on May 2nd, and then we'll be talking about just a general refresher on accounting for contributions and grants um, under the not for profit accounting standards, which is probably 90% of the accounting questions we get uh, is how do I account for this uh, gift or grant uh, type uh, agreement? So it'll be good to have that uh, information kind of refreshed for those folks that are interested in, in seeing that.